you that are new with us, we are going through the book of Genesis, and we're going to walk verse by verse through the first 11 chapters of this amazing book. So we're on week three. We are on week three, day, uh, day, week one, we covered two verses, and then on week two, last week, we covered days one and two of creation. Today, we're going to get through days three and four, Lord willing. So I'm excited about this, but somebody asked me the question this week, Pastor, why did you go to Genesis? Why did the Lord lead you to take the church through Genesis? And it was an interesting question because in one that I had thought of a lot, but uh, his, the answer to this person was a lot lengthier than I thought they were expecting, but it was a good reminder for us to say it again right here this morning. Why, are we, why is going through Genesis important? And it's because... This world that we live in is directly attacking the things of God. And God just put up on my heart for us to go back to the beginning, to kind of reset things. How did God truly design this planet in our lives to live in light of what he's doing? And Genesis has the answers to all of that. Uh, it takes us back to God's basic design for the world, for marriage, for relationships, Every part of our lives hinges upon our understanding of this very first book and how God set things up. But make no mistake about it, our society is on a quest for truth. What is truth? What isn't truth? And without this book right here, without absolute truth, we get to make up whatever we want to be truth. And we see that in our world today. Our world tells us that we can be anything we want to be. God tells us, I've made you in my image to be something specific. And so there's these, the, the world telling us one thing, God's word tells us another. And as we go through Genesis, that's my prayer, is that we would understand the basics of what God has started in our lives, how he designed this whole world for us and to be in a relationship with us. So... Just by way of reminder, Genesis was written by God himself, but penned through Moses. God gave these inspired words to Moses to record for us today. And now we're going to jump in to day number three. But let's go to him and ask him to illuminate this text. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. God, we are in need of a word from you. God, the world is throwing all kinds of things at us. Sometimes we don't know what's right or left or up or down or where the truth lies. And Lord, I pray that each person here would just pause. Would just focus on you. Focus on the words of these texts and how you designed it and how much you love us. And how amazing and big and powerful you truly are. So God, that's our desire this morning. Help us with this. Help us to understand this and speak to us individually. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, starting in verse 9, it says, Then God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. Now we have to break this verse down because just reading it, it's like, okay, it was so. God said it, it was so. But the very first word, then, it's a great reminder that this happened right then, immediately. Not over millions of years, right then, God said, let the waters below the heavens, and remember that word heavens has three different meanings. In this one, in the Hebrew language, it means skies. It means what's directly above us. So let those waters be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. Now, it's interesting that God would say, let all the waters be gathered into one place. So it was as if he was molding the shorelines as he spoke. Let the waters be gathered into one place. Here's the shorelines. Waters, don't you cross this line right here. And dry land appeared. Now, for those of you that are science people that enjoy that kind of thing, have you ever heard of Pangea? Anybody ever heard of Pangea? It's the one supercontinent, all of the land all together. Now, reading this plainly, I think that you could make a pretty decent argument that that could be possible at one time. Because if God said, let all the, gather, all the water gather into one place, that means there was land and then there was water in one place. Now, 
Study it on your own. Joe, good commercial earlier. Take this, study it on your own. Pray that God would give you wisdom during this. But it's interesting to think about these things. And it also would make sense that when the flood happened, that it would break apart those continents. It was a catastrophic event. Food for thought. But what we know is he assigned the oceans their boundaries. All the water gather into one place, let dry land appear. So, I don't know, and if you've ever been to the Creation Museum over in Kentucky, it it is amazing. They have these videos that simulate this. And it's an amazing ocean, and it's a good reminder. The whole earth was covered with water. There was no dry land. And it simulates the mountains and the continents bursting forth from the depths of the sea to allow dry land to appear. It's an amazing thing. If you haven't been, I would highly recommend going. It is an awesome experience. But God assigns streams and rivers and lakes and all of these different things bursting forth. The dry land appeared and he assigned the oceans its boundaries. And notice too that God didn't just say let land appear. He said let dry land appear. What happens when you take something out of a bucket of water? What is it? It's wet. This land was not wet. God specifically says when he spoke this to happen, it was immediately dry land. And we know that it was dry because on the next day, he's going to say, bring forth vegetation. And if it's a swamp, vegetation doesn't do great in really watery places, right? It's It's hard to grow. So we know that it was dry land. And we also know because God said at the end of verse 9, and it was so. God's speaking this into existence. There was no discussion. They weren't going back. God didn't go back and make the land more dry than it was. He didn't go back and make it better. It was just so because God said it was so. And then in verse 10, God called the dry land earth... And the gathering of the waters he called seas. We talked about this a little bit last week. But when God creates something, he gets to name it. Just like we do with a new puppy or our baby, whatever that is, we name it because we get to exercise authority over it. And that's what God is doing. God is the ultimate authority over the land and the ocean and the seas. And he gets to name it. We don't. And it's also interesting that here in verse 9 and 10, it's the last time in all of creation that God names something specific like this. Because as we're going to read on through Genesis, God delegates that authority to man to begin to name the animals and the birds and all those things. God delegates that to man. But here God is, and, and it's just this beautiful picture of him preparing this earth to be habitable. For life. Because as of right now, there still is no life. There is land and there is water, but there is no life as of yet. And it's also interesting, and I didn't study this a ton, so but I, I read something this week that the presence of water is only found on the planet Earth. That was so interesting to me. Because water has all kinds of amazing capabilities to it. It, it, The oceans, as we know, absorb so much heat from the sun and heat from the earth. It helps this place be habitable. It's the only way, really, that we could have oxygen and be able to live on this earth is because of how much water is here. It's got just amazing qualities that, and it's only found here. Isn't that interesting? It's only found here. And then in the middle of verse 10, or at the end of it, he says, And God saw that it was good. So what God is creating is perfect. It's good. Remember that Hebrew word for good means morally good. It means wonderful. It means excellent. It cannot possibly be made any better. That's difficult for us to think because when we make something, we're like, oh man, I wish I would have gone back and done this or that. But when God makes something, you cannot improve it. It is perfect in every way. 
And God saw that it was good, and that means that it was good. All right, we're halfway through day three. Now, day three has two accounts of creation. He does a, another thing here. So we're going to start in verse 11. Then, right then, immediately, after God allowed dry land to appear, right then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. Same day, dry land appeared, earth sprouted vegetation. The very first sign of life, the very first sign of life on the planet earth happened on day three. Think about the different kinds of plant life out there. I'm not a green thumb. I'm not a big plant person. But there is an amazing variety of plants and trees and flowers, colors, shapes, sizes, just millions of, di of variances in this. And that's what God was doing. He, he set it in the earth, sprouted vegetation immediately. And then it says, plants yielding seed. And fruit trees on earth bearing fruit after the kind was seed in them, and it was so. Notice the end of verse 11 there. Fruit trees, again, fully grown fruit trees. God didn't plant a little bitty seed and say, we're going to wait millions of years. Or I guess it doesn't take millions of years for a tree to grow. Okay, 10 years. He didn't say that. He said, tree. And there was a huge, fully developed tree with apples on it, with all kinds of fruit. Again, God created everything with the appearance of age, just like he created man. Here we're going to see in a, in a few creation days later. But God is putting plant life on the earth. Before the flood, also this was interesting, before the flood, and this is terrible really. Human beings could only eat plants and nuts. Isn't that sad? That's a sad thing. It didn't, it didn't last too long, though, because after the flood, God allowed us to have steaks and all those great things. But, it, but before the flood, we were vegetarians. So if you're a vegetarian here, you can say, well, we're biblical. But don't worry, steak eaters, because after the flood, it had changed everything. So we're after the flood. All right, so you can, you can drive that point home with them. But this is good news that God created the earth like this in an instant, fully functioning. Remember, God had to create dry land. He had to create plant life for oxygen. He had to do all these things. He had to say, let there be light before God could create his most wonderful creation, and that is man. So he's doing all of this to prepare the earth for his crown jewel of creation, mankind. And that's good news because the same way that God spoke the universe into existence, God speaks our salvation into existence. It is an instantaneous work of God when we cry out to Him, when we repent of our sins, when we surrender our life to Him, God, in an instant, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, never to be blotted out. And again, God cannot undo this. He is perfect. Everything he does is for a reason. It didn't happen over long periods of time, your salvation. It was instantaneous. It had nothing to do with you. That's the best part because we can't mess it up. What God does, he does perfectly. And notice there in verse 11, <clears throat> it says, After their kind. After their kind. Now that phrase is mentioned 10 times in chapter 1 alone. 10 times in chapter 1. And that word in Hebrew is men. M-I-N. And I, I did a lot of research on that this week. <clears throat> I still remember this from, from science class. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Anybody else remember that? I thought it was impressive. Thank you, Garrett. <laughs> It just came to mind. Like, I don't know. I don't even remember the name of a science teacher, but I remember that. But remember this word kind in the Hebrew. It's probably too far of a stretch to say it means species. But what it means is an animal of their own kind. It's close to species. In other words, what God is saying here is that the plants will produce their own kind. 
Here in a little bit, we're going to read how animals will produce their own kind. Human beings will produce their own kind. Plants cannot produce animals. Animals cannot produce human beings. You get it? That's what God was trying to tell us when he said these things will reproduce after their own kind. Two zebras cannot get together on mating season and create a cat. That's what God is trying to say. There is order to this. Now, you might say, well, what about the, the microevolution? Not, not the kinds becoming different kinds. And there are adaptations within their own kind, right? We see that in plant life very much. Is Steve Tuttle and Luke Kreider here today? You, they're, they're farmers. And you don't got to tell them that plants adapt, right? Steve, you used to be able to spray Roundup to kill your weeds, didn't you? About 10, 15 years ago. And now they had to come out with something that was Roundup 2. Because Roundup 1 didn't work because the plants weren't being killed by it. They adapted and now we need something stronger. Now you're on probably Roundup 17. I don't know. But plants and animals adapt to their environment so that they can survive. That's what God... It, a weed cannot become a corn stalk, though, right? That's what God is trying to say here. But the main point is that all of creation, everything that God created, he said was good. And he gave it boundaries so that everything would remain with their own kind. And he said, this is good. It's not good for something to not be their own kind. That's what God is telling us here in verse 11. And then in verse 12, he reiterates it. It's really the most lengthy explanation of creation we have apart from man, what God does here. So in verse 12, the earth brought forth vegetation. Again, immediately, it brought forth vegetation. Plants yielding seed after their kind. Trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. Again, the trees already had fruit on them. The plants already had seed in them. God is creating everything with the appearance of age, and it was good. So we can answer the question, right? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? The chicken. It's simple. The chicken. God created the chicken first. And God saw that it was good. Miss Di, your chickens are good. Where'd she go? There you go. Whoa, right here. Hello. All right. The chickens are good. All right. And then verse 13. We're going to read. How long did this take? God tells us again the time frame. There was evening and there was morning a third day. I'm not going to go into this again. Seems pretty straightforward to me. An evening, a morning, a morning and an evening is one day. It's one 24-hour day that God created all of this on the third day. And we have to stop and talk about the significance of the third day. There's a lot that goes on in the rest of Scripture where the third day is extremely significant. I want to take us to the very first verse, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, the third word. Remember that word beginning notates that God had an end in mind. It's a Hebrew word that said, from the very beginning, God had the end in mind. So from the very third word, we know that God had a plan for everything. For you, for me, for his creation, for his world, for everything. But there's also a third day in our New Testament that we get to read about. And it's no coincidence that on the third day of creation, God created life from death. Remember, darkness was over the face of the deep. There was no life. And then on the third day, God said, let there be life. Let there be vegetation. And you know the story in the Gospels. And it's a true story. That Christ came to a virgin named Mary to live a sinless life. To one day be nailed to the cross to die a death that we deserved. But he took our punishment for us. And he was killed. And he was dead. He was dead, dead. There was no life in him. He was dead. And then on the third day, he rose again. 
And you know what happened? God said, Jesus, arise. And it was so. And he arose. And he is in heaven right now, praying for us. And all authority on heaven and earth has been given to him. Because on the third day, God rose him from the dead. There's no coincidence here that what God is doing is foreshadowing the very gospel message that is the essence of Christianity. Just like the dry land was raised above the sea level, Christ was raised to life again. And think about that. That's our own story. We were all dead. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We had no life in us spiritually. We had no hope. It was darkness was hovering over the the surface of our souls. There was nothing there. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4. I love how Paul writes to the Corinthians and tells them this. For I delivered to you, church, at first importance... What I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. This third day is everything for us. And God had a plan from the very beginning. He had a plan for earth and he's got a plan for you and I. Day four. Day four is where God creates and gives lights, the sun, moon, and stars, But before we read this description, and it's a marvelous description of what God does here, I want to lay a little groundwork for us to help us just have a little picture of how big our galaxy is, of how big the heavens are. We've seen some beautiful sunsets. You've probably been outside, and I love it up here in Baser because you can look up on a clear night and see just stars everywhere. It is beautiful. Behind me on that screen is a picture I took this morning, right out here in the parking lot. I drove in and I was like, "Wow, look at that!" It it it's a hor- it, like the picture doesn't do justice. It was just like, "Wow, look at the majesty and the color that God used for the sunrise this morning." But I want to just get our minds wrapped around of how little. We are compared to the universe. If we were to count one star per second, and this is just in our Milky Way galaxy, just in our galaxy, which is a blip on the radar of the entire universe, just in our Milky Way galaxy, if we were to count one star per second, it would take us 2,500 years to count the stars in our galaxy. In the Milky Way galaxy where our solar system is located is just a fraction of everything. If, if, I'll put it to you this way, and this, this really opened my eyes. Our solar system, if it were the size of a quarter, a a true size of a quarter, compared to the Milky Way galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy would be the entire size of North America. Let that sink in about how little we really are compared to a great God. So as we read day four, keep this in mind. Keep this in mind as we read about how insignificant. I'm not trying to make you feel small. (laughs) I kind of am. I want you to see how small we are compared to how big God is. But let's read this, verse 14. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens. This is outer space he's talking about. Let there be lights to separate the day from the night. And remember on day two, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And now on day four, he's placing lights in the expanse, in the heavens, in the sky. Verse 14 goes on. And let them, and we're going to read about what them is. It's the sun, moon, and stars. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Again, God is creating this entire galaxy, this entire universe with us in mind because what are these for? These are for signs. What are signs for? It's not hard to look in history books. Stars were used for navigation before we had Garmin. Did you know that? Yeah, you did. 
But that's, that's how people got around. They set sail and they were looking at the stars, the constellations, to figure out where was north, where was south, where am I going? They were for signs. God gave them there and it was good. The second thing, he created them for seasons. We live in Kansas. We don't need to be taught about seasons. We know all about seasons. We get the full dose of everything. And I'm thankful for it. And then for days, God set up the seven-day week. It's his design. And then for years, did you know that the earth revolves around the sun every 365.25 days? That's how often the earth revolves around the sun. How many days are on our calendar? 365, except for this, day, this year because it's leap year. So every four years, you got leap year. By the way, what are you going to do with your extra day this year? You got a whole extra day. Be thinking about what God wants you to do with that. All right? We'll, be, we'll, we'll maybe have some projects around the church. Okay. <laughs> but it's awesome how God set this whole thing up with us in mind for our good, to give us structure, to give us seasons, to give us days, years, months. It's amazing. Verse 15. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. In that, uh, when I read that, it just jumped off the page. God set all of this up in the universe beyond to, to give us lights. Where? For this little tiny clump of dirt called earth. He did all of that so that it will give light to the earth. Amazing. And then at the end of verse 15... And it was so. Immediately, right then, no lengthy time passed. It was so, right then. Verse 16, God made two great lights. The greater light to cover the, cover the day and the lesser light to govern the night. We don't need a philosophy degree to determine what those are. The sun and the moon. And it, it's amazing that God records these. He names these as the greater light. The, the Hebrew word for sun is S-E-M-E-S. I don't know how to say semes or something like that. But he didn't call it the sun. And the, the Hebrew word for moon is yaria for moon. But he didn't call them that. And as I was studying it this week, it makes sense. All of the pagan religions, what did they worship? They worshiped the sun and the moon and they would call them those Hebrew words. So God from the very beginning said, it's a greater light. You know what it's for? It's for the human beings on earth to give light to. It's not to be worshipped. I am alone to be worshipped. Not the sun, not the moon. I place them there. Those are my creation. You are not to worship those things. I'm not even going to call them their name because they're not even worthy of that. And neither should we. We should call them the sun and the moon. It's okay to call them the sun and the moon. Let me rephrase that. But we shouldn't worship them. We should not worship them. And then... Uh, there at the end of verse 16, he said, in almost, passing, in almost passing, he says, he made the stars also. So he made a greater light, a lesser light, and he made the stars also. And it's interesting because we always think of, oh, the sun is just a big star. It's, it's just another one of the billions and billions of stars out there. But the Bible almost differentiates them more than we do. And I think it's good for us to see you know, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 41 says, There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. So God is differenti differentiating these, these things. So what was the purpose of those, the sun, the moon, and the stars? Verse 17 tells us, God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light to the earth. Not to worship to give light. That's the simple fact. And he also gave them to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good in verse 19. And there was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. God is setting this up for his crowning creation that he's going to do on day six. And that's mankind. He's making the earth perfectly habitable with lights with oxygen, with water, with air, all of those things with us in mind. Psalm 19, verse 1. 
It says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. It's not hard to look up and to just be in awe. The perfect act of creation that God is performing. God made everything perfectly without any hiccup. He didn't need to redo any of it. It was the way it is because that's the way God wanted it to be. We don't need to get in our own way and try to think too much of this. God said it and it was so. Psalm 33 verse 6. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth all their lights. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 25 says. To whom then will you liken me or compare me to? That I would be his equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. Billions of stars. God knows the name of every one of them. Billions of people. God knows the name of every single one of us. God makes no mistakes. You are not here by chance. You are not some byproduct of primordial soup that just happened to evolve into something. You are a perfect creation because God created you that way. However, I can't say these words without remembering what's coming in Genesis chapter 3 because we mess it up. We fall short. We all have. Romans 3.23 we all know it, but it's still true. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And friends, I just want to ask you this morning, do you understand that because of your sin, you have fallen short? I have fallen short of God's glory. In glory it is. Look what he made. But we have fallen short. Psalms chapter 14. I love this. It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek after God. They have turned aside. Together they have become come corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. So if you're here today, friend, and you think you're good, based on what the Bible teaches I just have to tell you in the most loving way that I can, you're not. You're not. But there's new, good news. There's good news because there is one that is good. And his name is Jesus. And he had a plan. And he knew that we were going to fall. There was darkness hovering over the face of the deep. And there was darkness in our spiritual lives. But Paul tells us in Romans 10 verse 9 and 10, how it can all change in an instant. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised them from the dead, you will be saved. There will be a light that's turned on spiritually in your life. For it's with the heart that a person believes resulting in righteousness. Righteousness because God is righteous, not because we're righteous. And with our mouth we confess resulting in salvation. Friends, that's the good news of the gospel. And it's found in the very first chapter of the book. We're not even off of the first page yet. I haven't even got to turn the page to page two. And we see the gospel so clear because we see God so clear in this creation. So if you don't know him today, I beg you, seek him. Seek after him. Knock and it will be opened. Knock and it will be opened. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, God, just thankful to read these, these words of creation and be reminded of how big you are, of how amazing, of how holy, of how other you are than us. God, our minds can't comprehend your greatness. And a lot of times, God, our minds can't comprehend how much you love us, that despite our shortcomings, God, we often think that we've done too many bad things to be able to come to you. And God, that is a lie from the pit of hell because you tell us, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest for your soul. You want us to bring it all to you. So God, that's our prayer as a church. 
God, that each of us individually would bring it all to your cross. And God, we thank you for saving us when we didn't deserve it. So God, I pray that you would speak to us individually right now. In Jesus' name, amen.